Welcome to the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and I am a former doctor turned lifestyle entrepreneur. I decided that I was done being physically tied to my business and that I was going to spend the second half of my life living a bigger life and maximizing all the areas of my life, like family, friends, spiritual, travel, my health. And I also knew I was going to need some help with this. So I reached out to the best minds on the planet who are experts in their field to help me to not only create true time and money freedom, but to also help me to lead a truly fulfilled life. Come take this journey with me. Excuses are over. It's time to live. One of the best things you can do on a daily basis is read something that gives you inspiration and encouragement and hope. All of us want to be called out to something greater. Own your area of genius. Know it, live it, own it, and don't be afraid. It's your gift to the world and use it to serve others. My moral obligation to any of my clients is not sell them any more than they should, but also not sell them any less than they should. What's up, everybody? This is Rob Murgatroyd, and welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. Today's guest is Michael Zeller. Who is Mike? Mike is a serial entrepreneur that has nine businesses that he runs at the same time. The businesses range from real estate to clothing. He is a master at architecting businesses that run mostly without him. In fact, I hired Mike to help me develop this podcast and to develop the Work Hard, Play Hard brand. We dig into exactly how he coached me and we cover everything from how to work in your zone of genius to the chokehold that most businesses have, to what it's like living in foreign countries with the specific purpose of expanding your bandwidth. You can find them on the socials at Michael R. Zeller, Z-E-L-L-E-R. And without further ado, please enjoy this conversation I had with Mike Zeller. Michael, welcome to the show. (laughs) Excited to be here, man. It's going to be fun. You're, you're always a joy to connect with. Um, I'm fascinated with you and uh, excited to dive in. Awesome. You know, I, I thought we would begin with the thing that, frankly, most blows me away about you, and that is how you can be so freaking chill and run seven companies, I, which I think is what, I don't know if you're running more than that, um, simultaneously. Is it Xanax? I mean, what, what are you doing? <laughs> I think it's um, part of my wiring. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about personality types in areas of genius before. And, um, you know, I've got this, uh, you know, I'm a Taurus on the ast- astrological stuff, and, but I'm also like an INTP. Uh, I'm a high DI, you know, I, I, I've got all these things where I tend to ground and center people. My, my fiance appreciates that a lot. My team appreciates it. Um, but I've been able to just also, I've been fascinated with the concept of architecting a business. And as I've been architecting my own businesses, I've worked my way out of the operations of many facets and and been able to identify my greatest areas of genius, my greatest areas of impact, and and how to reduce you know those areas and those uh, exertions where it just doesn't have much of an impact and it's also not fulfilling for me anymore. So yeah. Anyway. You know, we're going to get into all of those letters that you just mentioned, the LMNOP and the AD, ATPA, like all of that stuff we're going to talk about. Um, for you, that's second nature. And when we get into sort of why personally, personality tests have been so important, you know, we'll talk about that. But I'd like to begin with a simple question, which is how would you describe at a cocktail party what it is that you do for a living? So... Now, I've gotten even more clarity on that in the last six months. And ultimately, what I do is I'm a business architect. And so if you think about if you and your wife, Kim, are going to build your dream home and budget is not a limitation, you come alongside, you want to hire a freaking amazing architect. And that architect, if they're really good, they're going to listen to you and they're also going to listen to uh, the contradictions that you might say, you know, where the typical client that's coming to an architect, 
they're going to be saying one thing and then on the other end they might be contradicting themselves a little bit but there there's something in between listening to the words in between and that's often where the truth is and where that per, that person uh, if you know how to interpret what they're saying you can pull out what it is they really want and then you know like your third or fourth meeting with the architect then he comes to you with designs and renderings that are uh, to reflect what you want and and designing the home around how you want to live and how you envision yourself. Um, same thing with a business is, is basically what I come alongside. I do it at first in my own businesses, designing uh, the business around my unique skill sets, my values, uh, the people I want to do business with. Um, and then, you know, I do that for other clients. As, as you know, I love to dive in, do strategy sessions, help take someone from 20% clarity to 40% clarity or 50% to 70% in building out their business and designing it around the life they want to live, which is a no core to work hard, play hard and what you're doing in your life as well. So, okay. So just for context, how many companies do you own and what industries are they all in? Um, I have equity interest in nine or 10 different businesses then. So, all right. So I've got a, two real estate, uh, entities. Uh, one does, you know, boutique high end, uh, real estate sales in Nashville. Um, also a commercial office building, private office space type deal. Then I've got a men's clothing line, uh, that is basically run by my marketing agency and my, I've, in essence, designed my marketing agency to be the mother hub of all my businesses. Because Lee Iacocca said, you can have brilliant ideas, but if you can't get them across, they're not worth anything. And so if I look at the best businesses, the best ideas, they rarely win. It's usually the best marketed. So I've designed my marketing agency to become my mother hub. Um, And then I've got a Rising Stars Mastermind, which is another core focus and central passion. Then I've got an augmented tech company, augmented reality company, the the founder of that. I'm just an advisor and investor, um, but the founder of that created the face filters for like Snapchat, all those little, you know, bunny ears and things like that that people put on Snapchat and Instagram. He actually created that. Um, and then his new company is doing a really cool uh, it's called Mojit. Uh, it's doing these, you create your own character, your own Moji. Um, so imagine texting that to someone and your Moji is talking and looks like you. Um, then I've got, uh, another company. It's, it's called life guides. It's, uh, doing, uh, basically solving some of the world's biggest problems, which is suffering and people going through significant life challenges by pairing them with others who have gone through similar life challenges in a paraprofessional model like Uber, you know, where you get, uh, you get paid a living wage to walk someone through, uh, like loss of a loved one or Alzheimer's or something like that. And then what else? I've got a couple, oh, and another textile company in the fashion world, kind of a revolutionary fashion product uh, using recycled uh, fibers and and that's about to launch. And then a uh, sustainable home collection <laughs> with another sustainable fashion business and then probably another one or two that I'm forgetting. All right. So this is it, it, like, it, it took you three minutes <laughs> to name <laughs> every single company and, and give, you know, two sentences on what they do. It's like, I don't even understand how to begin that. So I guess I have a million questions. I'm going to try and just drill it down to the essence of the question, which is why don't you just own one company and focus all your energy on it? And that's, that's where I often confound people. It's because it's not my wiring. And Now, I do have two core focuses. This year, my two core focuses are my mastermind, Rising Stars, because I'm loving that. And I get to just play that part of being a business architect for other entrepreneurs and creators. And then secondly, my my marketing agency. Um, And then within that, I have major focuses in different businesses. But um, 
ultimately it's in in terms of my wiring like the wealth dynamics side we talked about i'm a creator and and i i would when i only had one thing going on it i was so bored and i was frustrated and i was banging my head against the wall now it is accurate and it is wise that i should channel my focus into you know uh, several focused areas. And so that's why I've decided this year, my mastermind and my, my agency are my core focuses. If I succeed at those two, then the rest is gravy. So those get the majority, probably 70% of my energy right now. My real estate business gets another good chunk of that. But uh, and then the others, you know, as time goes on, some of these others are going to get uh, different amounts of energy too. Um, but I would be bored. That's the simple answer. If, if it's all yeah, I did. No, that's a great answer. I mean, so I guess the question then becomes if, you know, I've, I have a couple of companies that I'm running right now and, you know, I wake up in the morning with ideas and, you know, just running the two or three companies that I have right now, one I'm phasing out, um, there's, you know, it feels stressful, if I'm honest, trying to manage all of those different things. I couldn't even imagine if that was exponentially bigger, even if my personality lended itself to that. So, you know, a- apparently there are systems that are in place that allow you to do that, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But I think before we do that, we need to talk a, uh, a bit about the personality tests that you've been alluding to. And I know that taking personality tests are important for you to better understand yourself. And, you know, when we met uh, for my one-on-one brainstorming session I did with you, you made me take five different personality tests, the DISC model, the Gallup test, uh, Myers and Briggs, the Colby index, wealth dynamics, and we'll link up uh, all of that in the show notes. But I I guess the question is, why did you want me to take all those personality tests and why are they so important? Yeah. It, the reason I had you take them and most of my clients have them take them is because us as the entrepreneurs and the creators or leaders of our business, one of the things we often lack is just real clarity on who we are. Now, we think we know, but every, every 5% makes a big difference. And so my thought was, hey, one, I want to understand you and understand how, if we're going to build out this, help you build out this business, how do we, how do you like to work? How do you like to be communicated with? And that helps us serve you more effectively. Secondly, it helps you uh, lead more effectively because then you start your clarity of this is how I like to work. And these are also my gaps. I'm not as good at this. I'm not as gifted at that. I need to delegate or manage this weakness. So when you have clarity on, around that, it allows you to take more decisive action. And when you can take more decisive action, you can build more momentum. And, and so that's why we start with that. And that's why, you know, focusing in on your area of genius and then realizing, hey, you know, there's certain things I do right now that generate a thousand, five thousand, even ten thousand dollars an hour, and those are often my greatest areas of genius. And I know that, and I know how to position myself because I understand my wiring. Like if I look at my Myers Briggs, the acronym for INTP is Architect. So I started figuring out, hey, this is actually what I do. I can see, I can help someone architect their business. And not many people can do that. And I have a fascination and and obsession with the great game of business. And so if I can step alongside these high level thought leaders like yourself and others, uh, man, I can do a lot of good. Well, I'll tell you what, what came out of it for me. I, I definitely like having procedures, checklists, and systems. And I, I think that, you know, I used to hide behind that, you know, sort of like not letting people know that that's how I like to think, but just doing it on the back end. But what one of the things that came out of it for me was identifying that that was the thing that came through with all of my personality tests, that maybe it would be a good idea to tell my team that I work with systems and that's how I work best. And so since doing that, we've created um, a workflow that they understand why 
um, I've got checklists and procedures and systems manuals, et cetera, for them to follow. And, you know, even though they don't think that way, they understand that I do, and that's how I process information. So having that understanding has really helped me. So I would recommend anybody um, take those personality tests that that Mike recommended uh, for me. So, um, you know, there were a few things that came out of our time together that I still use that I think can be super helpful uh, for people. Um, the first is a concept that you taught me, which is that a project only needs to be at 80% at any given time. Can you explain that and why that's so important? Yeah. So, uh, by the way, just to acknowledge your areas of your area of genius. Like when I look at you and I saw your skill set and your ability to systematize and just, and like blueprint out all the execution steps, I was blown away. Mm. Right. So to own your area of genius and to step into it instead of hiding behind it, that's a powerful shift that's only beginning, right? And so for your listeners, I encourage you guys, own your area of genius. Know it, live it, own it, and don't be afraid. It's your gift to the world and use it to serve others. It's where your power is, right? Yeah, it's your power. So anyway, now, wh- sorry, what that, was your that's, question there? That's okay. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, how at any one given time, a project really can only go about 80%. And you referenced a company, and I can't remember the company that did that concept. And since um, since you recommended it to me, it has been revolutionary, legitimately in my life, revolutionary. And once you explain it, I'll explain why it's been revolutionary. Great. Yeah, so two, two, two people I'll mention, GE Six Sigma Process and Dan Sullivan with Strategic Coach. He's got a book called The 80% Approach. Go order it on Amazon, especially if you're a perfectionist or you struggle with uh, procrastination, which is usually a sign of perfectionism. Um, it, it's the single best book for helping un, uh, undo perfectionism and procrastination that hinders your progress. So here's the concept. All of us want to get as fast and as far as we can to a project being completed and completed at a very high level. But it's contradictory, seemingly, uh, on how we get there, if you really embrace this 80% approach. First, you got to think of how do I get something as quickly as possible to 80% so someone else can take it the next 80%. So if you think about that, um, if I can get it first 80% of getting out, what's that actual next step of the 80%? So for me, it might be just getting the idea out. And so like if, I, if it's an idea for an article or a process that I want to create for a client, and literally I will voice memo it. It might take me five minutes. Um, it's taken me sometimes as little as a minute and a half. I'll voice memo it out and email it. You know, I'll be walking down the street on, with my iPhone. I'll record it and I'll send it to a writer or someone on my team. They'll architect it out, you know, like type it out, etc., Then they'll send it back to me. So they took it the next 80%. They send it back to me. Then I polish it up and take it another 80%. And by that time, it's like not near, not 100%, but it's almost 100% done by the time I polish it up. Now, maybe a few more revisions, but instead of me saying, oh, I got to sit down and do the whole thing and architect it out just right, I might not ever get to that. So the speed at which it can happen, and like if you look, the numbers, if I take something from 80%, hand it off to someone, they take another 80%. Now we're at 96% completion. Then the the third round, I take it another 80% improvement. That's at like 99.6% or whatever. GE Six Sigma process, which has been the world standard at manufacturing excellence, which is six parts per million uh, being faulty, and six iterations of how do we make something, how do we improve something 80% more? That's all it is. So give an example of how they use that at GE. 
Good question. I don't entirely know because I haven't been through their Six Sigma mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. but they look at each process. So in other, in other um, words, like making a light bulb, for example, at GE, you know, obviously yeah. not inventing electricity, but, you know, making a new product, let's say they just come up with it. Somebody else takes it 80% and it keeps bouncing back 80%, right? Yeah. In essence, that's what it does. You, you send it to the next person with an 80% you know, take, take it as far as you can, but you don't have to take it all the way. We get hung up that we have to take it all the way. That was my, that was my issue. Um, you know, after taking this personality test, a lot of things came uh, into light for me. One of which is that, yes, I'm a systems guy, but being a systems guy, I wanted the system to be complete, tight, foolproof, but that's just not the way things happen when it comes to ideas. So I adopted your principle when I got back from our session and I said, okay, well, look, I, you know, I'm going to make the system now to be 80%. I'm only going to take this yeah. thing to 80%. <laughs> and that one little shift has changed everything because I've been able to communicate with my team and say, look, um, I don't have this worked out. And I've only got about 80% of this done. I'm going to have you take it to the next level. And that ping pong back and forth, really in about two, three, maybe four sessions, iterations, bounce backs, um, you wind up with a much finer product than trying to force it out of you and deliver that in one sitting. Exactly. And then what's cool about it is you're relying on other people's genius too. Instead of you trying to be the genius at the whole freaking process, mm -hmm. now, hey, you're relying on this person, on Chris or Nick or Niall or whoever to improve it in the way that they see, uh, the way that they're gifted. Love it. Okay. So you also mentioned um, the 80-20 approach, um, but it's not the traditional 80-20 approach that you know we've all heard about. This is like the 80-20 of the 80-20. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So most of us know the Pareto principle of the top 20% produces 80% of our results. Well, what if you applied it again, meaning the top 20% of the top 20%, which is the top 4%. And in a fully developed business, they found that the top 4% produces as much as 64% of a company's revenue. Amazing. Can you give me an example of how you've applied that 80-20-80-20 principle twice or three times? Yeah. So if I look at, all right, let's, let's use Tony Robbins. Uh, I think he's a good example of this. Um, so, you know, he's got products and programs for the masses. Then, uh, for the people that actually sign up and go to a live event, you know, that starts at about $500 a ticket. Then it scales up to business mastery, which is like 10 grand. Then you got date with destiny, which is like 5,000 or so, um, as well. But then you got the platinum partnership and the platinum partnership is 75 grand a year plus, uh, you've got the additional ticket sales that are when you go to a platinum only event, it's an additional 10 grand. So you've got another, you've got about a hundred thousand dollars invested with pony. When you do a platinum partnership group, there's about 300 people out of the tens of thousands of people that go to an event. There's about 300 ish people that go to that are platinum partner members at any one time. Um, and those are the ones like I was a platinum partner member. And instead of me paying, uh, you know, 500 bucks for a ticket, I'm paying a hundred thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. to be part of the platinum partner group. And, and then guess what? Guess how much business I sent Tony in the last, um, last four or five years I sent, I've sent him over $600,000 worth of business not including my, my own, how much I've spent with him. So, so he's generated from me, one of his core, you know, top 4% raving fans, he's generated $600,000. If you have a business architect around fulfilling the needs of your top 4%, 
you hear, you can crush it. And it ultimately comes from Perry Marshall's, you want to drop the seed, Perry Marshall's 80-20 sales and marketing book. One of the best ones that I've read. Yep. I picked that one up after you mentioned it and it was, uh, it was exactly the way you just described it. So one of the other things that we talked about uh, when we were together is um, we talked about sort of identifying who my avatar was for this particular podcast and more specifically who they were not. So this is kind of like a two-part question. I guess the first part is maybe can you give us an overview of what that process is of uh, defining what the avatar is and then talk to me a little bit about um, how every time we dig into that, you would say, okay, let's stop and let's ideate on that, which is a word that I never heard used before. So can you kind of give me some color there? Yeah, you got it. So Hero's Journey is a foundational piece for a lot of great marketing and a lot of great storytelling in the movie industry, even in songs and other elements, speeches even. Um, but when you go through the hero's journey and, and the hero's journey uh, and formatted into a marketing grow your business type format, it, we call it a storyboard. We craft a narrative around your target client and then target client you a great marketing helps the client become the hero of their story it's not a lot of businesses a lot of companies you read their page you watch their videos it's it's very focused on the company being the hero that's that doesn't work that doesn't connect um so in the hero's journey you've got a character that wants something and then they encounter a problem or an obstacle uh, internally and externally. So that's step number two. They encounter a problem or obstacle. Step number three, they connect with a guide or a mentor. That's you, the company, the um, thought leader, whatever it may be. And then you do three things as the company. You connect with empathy. People want to feel understood. They want to feel liked. They want to know that you care. Then step number two, establish authority. Uh, so when you establish authority, you're helping them understand, hey, I've been there. I've done that. I've helped countless other people or countless other companies do this. And step number three is you impart belief. We, you know, everything in life, we want uh, sometimes one of the best things that you can do for your clients is just let them know you believe in them. And that you see that oftentimes, that's the difference. All of us have latent potential, but sometimes the difference between us achieving our potential and not achieving it is just belief in ourselves. I didn't realize as we went through that process was the concept of the guide. And it's so important. And I'm, I'm remembering now how important I need to make sure that I put that into action. The problem with hanging out with a guy like you is that your brain freaking explodes when you're with you. <laughs> and you can't possibly remember everything that happens. And just as a side note for people listening, we filled floor to ceiling whiteboards up. Like, I don't know how many times. And then we just kept a rate. Like it was insane. We had to take photos of all of the, I think I had 16 photos of filled whiteboards that we then had to interpret. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So remember that though, for, for your audience, man, Communicate your belief to your clients. It's huge. Um, then the, the fourth step is, uh, the, you know, after meeting the guide, the next step is the guide provides a plan or a roadmap on how you're going to get from here to there. Then step number five um, is you paint a picture of what success looks like. The heaven if you do. And this is like, a, you know, you paint a picture of the client achieving the results they want. Then step number six, you paint a little bit of a picture of failure, the pain or the hell if you don't. That FOMO is a key, key driver that most of us neglect to some extent. You, you, you don't want it to show up any more than 25% of like your sales funnel, your landing page, your messaging, um, and how you present your offer. But it needs to be there. Because if you care about them and you care about them making the right decision and your product, your service actually adds real value and is worth more than what you're charging, they need to know what they're going to miss out on. Yeah, for if, sure. If they, if they should have bought, and I operate from a fiduciary mindset of 
hey, my moral obligation to any of my clients is not sell them any more than they should, but also not sell them any less than they should. Mm -hmm. Interesting distinction. So it's not about, some people have, you know, sort of a belief of, I don't want to feel like a salesperson. But the other side of that is if you don't sell them what they need, then they can't get the job done. Yeah, exactly. So I love that. All right. So, you know, your training is, you know, really super diverse. And by training, I'm talking about everything from, you know, college to, uh, to things like platinum partner that you mentioned earlier, uh, with Tony Robbins. Um, Speaking of that, I, I know that that is a very exclusive club that, you know, is sort of vetted by Tony. You mentioned that, you know, it's around 100000 bucks a year all in. Um, can you describe a little bit about what that experience was like and if there was a particular story that you're willing to share that's most impacted you as a Platinum Partner? When I first joined Tony Robbins, like I, uh, in the Platinum Partnership group, man, I, I literally, I'd made... I was on pace to make 200 grand that year and I made that commitment in fall. It was like October of 20, uh, I guess it was 2013 and you know, October, 2013, I'm in London. I'm at this business mastery event and I'm just convicted that I got to join platinum partner because I got to work through some of my own hangups, some of my own limitations, some of the, uh, areas that I was not playing full out. I was, I was playing it safe. I was comfortable being good when I could be outstanding, like truly outstanding at what I, what I, uh, do in the world. And, but if I didn't step into that next level and if I didn't commit and by committing to Tony Robbins at that point, I knew he was going to call me out and the whole experience would shatter my ceilings, both in belief in myself and in my patterns. And so I, I, it, I dropped 15 grand as a deposit. And then I was like calling up all my credit card companies to see which ones I could raise the limit for because I had to pay, you know, five grand a month. And I didn't know how I was going to pay the hundred thousand dollars <laughs> because I didn't, you know, that was half my income that year before expenses. And um, so, but I figured it out. And my income, you know, it's when things become a must, we tend to figure it out. And so the next year, I doubled my income and doubled my net worth um, in the very next 12 months. And um, so, uh, it, and it was the environment. I remember going to my first Platinum Partner event and not believe, like, I didn't feel like I belonged. I was like, I snuck in here. People, I, like, they don't know what I make. They don't know, <laughs> they don't know that, like, hey, I'm, I'm only, fraud, like. I'm a, I'm a fraud. Wait till they find yeah, out who I really exactly. am. Yeah. yeah. I'm 34 yeah. years old, and all these guys are, most of them are in their 40s and 50s and 60s. And they're worth, you know, a second night there in Hawaii. I had dinner with this couple and he had just sold his company for $120 million. And then the night before I met these guys that had like their PhD from Harvard and their masters from MIT and, you know, some of the smartest guys in the world at what they do. And yeah, you're out, you're out moneyed, out educated. Yeah. But by the end of that year, we were talking about belief by the end of that year. It's funny. You get yourself in those type of environments that are a little beyond your comfort zone. Like I've been in several high level masterminds. I know you've got one coming up and you should create one as well someday. Um, but man, by that end of that first year, I saw myself completely differently and I did feel like I belonged. And my mindset shifted about myself, which shifts everything, shifts how I act, shifts how I think, shifts the types of decisions I make. Everything. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about that. What rituals do you have in place now that sort of have helped you escape that middle class mindset? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So one is um, one of the core ones that has accelerated that is joining a mastermind. So I've got, uh, you know, I'm in Lewis Howell's mastermind. Um, I'm in, in another one as well. And then, of course, I have my own. But the getting around people that are playing at a high level um, and that they're they're doing stuff that's different from what I'm doing. You know, I in, in Lewis's mastermind, for example, I've hired more people. I've built more teams than pretty much most everyone in the group. But 
some of these guys have made way more money than I have in different areas. And they built different, bigger social platforms. And I get to learn from them. And then they get to learn from me. But it shifts, shifts. So being a part of that mastermind is one of the single best things that you could do. Um, but then I have my daily rituals of like, I read a chapter in a book pretty much every day, if not more, uh, strive to read a book a week. Um, let's see. I certainly work out three or four times a week. You read a chapter a day at least. So like, like, what does that look like for you? You wake up, you read the chapter, you do it before you go to bed. Like what, what, where, when do you do it? You know, when I was in college, I used to literally, when I first heard that, uh, leaders are readers, I made it a goal to read a book a week because uh, one of the guys, my second seminar I ever went to, Brian Tracy, he said, and I was 20 years old, he said, hey, if you want to be an expert in your chosen field, it only takes one book a month for three years. So 36 bucks. And then you'll be a top one percenter. Guess what? Top one percenters earn disproportionately more than non-top one or three percenters. So... I was like, dude, I don't want to wait a year. I don't want to wait three years. I'm going to, I'm going to do it this, this year while I was in college. <laughs> and so I would literally in college at midnight is typically when I would read because that was just my rhythm. Now, most of my reading happens in the morning. I don't turn my phone on before 9 a.m. Uh, usually, and I just dive right in. I do my meditation, my 12, 10 minutes of priming, which is a Tony Robbins exercise, which is basically a meditation exercise. Then I, you know, read a little scripture, a little further meditation, prayer time. And then I dive right into whatever book I'm reading when I'm on an airplane. Like I've got four flights this week. Guess what? I'm cranking through some books and, uh, and it's feeding my mind, nourishing my mind. Yeah. We'll, we'll link up to, uh, Tony Robbins, um, uh, what is that called? The priming process. We'll link up to that. There's uh, you can get it for free on SoundCloud. Freaking mm. amazing. I mean, it's like 14 mm-hmm. minutes. That'll change your, your day. Um, so when yeah. you're, when you're um, doing things like masterminds and working with people like you have with me doing brainstorm sessions, et cetera, I'm sure that a lot of things that come up for people are bottlenecks that they have in their business. Is there a common theme for you about what those bottlenecks are? In other words, Tony always talks about, you know, the, the, the chokehold of any business is the psychology of the business owner. You know, maybe you can kind of elaborate a little bit on that thought. Chokehold for most businesses, it comes around four core things. And in my one day strategy, strategy sessions, we tackle one, if not all four of these things. And they're usually around strategy, structure, systems, and support. So uh, that's always a limitation. And if you have, if you're a solopreneur, you're handcuffed by one of those four things um, at the moment. And, and then as you get four people then you're if you have four people on your team there's probably something in there for one of those four things but at a different level you know the strategy and the structure and the systems have to be different from one person to four to 11 to 25 to 50 to 100 to a thousand all those things change and it's hard for most as you build a business it's hard for you to shift all of those at the same time but you must be aware of them. And, and like my next level, you know, I've got 25 people on my teams right now and, uh, I'm, I'm really getting some of the systems and structure dialed in so I can, I can scale pretty fast this year. Uh, it's, it's almost always a chokehold around the owner's mindset and the owner's mindset around those four areas. Um, but it's often, uh, a belief around the owner, you know, we are the lid of our businesses. Um, so that's got to, that's got to shift and break through. I guess the question is you, I've seen firsthand your ability to hire people for what they're good at and let them do it. Um, as an example, you may or may not be aware of this, but you know, one of the, one of the things that I did not have, um, for this particular podcast was a bio for whatever reason, I just never had a bio. And, um, Mm -hmm. so, one of your uh, one of your teammates, uh, Kristen, had you know uh, said, "Well, you know, I'll uh, I'll interview you for a bio," and she did, and she did a, uh, such an amazing job that I got about halfway through the interview, 
And I just lost my shit. I just started crying. I've never done that before. <laughs> I literally, I, I couldn't speak. She, I think she thought, you know, maybe we were disconnected, you know, like the phone got disconnected and she's like, are you there? And I'm like, yeah, I'm there. And I just, she brought me back to a really, really painful place in my life and going through that process just so that she can get the answers to those questions was really tough. So I tell you this story, number one, because um, if, if, and well, if people want to read that bio, it's, it's up on the, uh, the work hard, play hard podcast.com website. Um, and number two is when you hire somebody like Mike does, um, that are really, really good at what they do, they produce results like that. So my bio is an amazing bio. Your ability to hire her is amazing. And her, jo- her zone of genius in this area was something that in my 51 years, I've never, ever experienced. So I just wanted to make sort of a public uh, acknowledgement of that. That's really cool. That's an awesome story. She didn't share share that part with me, but uh, she she did share. She wrote the bio, and that's really cool, man. That's uh, I'm honored to hear that, and excited to hear that as well. So that's killer. So, what is your process for hiring people that stick with your organization? I mean, like, how do you how do you find these people that are so amazing and fun and engaging and like I you know I see you hanging out with them and you guys are all you know you're in an air at B and B together and you're you know it's it's a kumbaya you know sort of like you know you're all in your jammies doing shots and uh, unpack that for me like how does that start if you're hiring somebody yeah so I you know it starts with the responsibility as a leader to serve and so that's how I, I look at it is like my one of my roles. Yes, I have my own vision. I have my own dreams. I have my own desires with my business and what I want to build. But I want to find out from the beginning, what is it they want to build? What is it they're most gifted at? What is it that brings them life instead of what brings them death? And, and so I want to design a role around them. Now, yes, all of us in, in different businesses, we have to uh, do things that don't bring us joy sometimes. You know, we have to. I remember at one of my other businesses, I had to clean the toilet one time because no one else was there to do it. And I'm the owner and, and it needed to be done. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> and so I write out a good job description or my team does now at the most most. Most of the time, they write out the job description, and then I add elements of the vision. Because people, most people are magnetized and drawn by a vision, and most people don't necessarily have the vision. Um, us as entrepreneurs, we're generally, not always, but we're often more gifted in the vision. And that's what you know we think everyone else is like us, but they're really not. They Others want to be led and want to have an inspiring vision to pursue. So we, we create that more often than not, and we create it with our team um, as well. But so the job description, I start out, you know, write an inspiring job description, not the boring ass job description that everyone and their mother and their brother puts on Craigslist, on Indeed, on Monster, whatever. Don't... If you're, if you just write a factual, this is what you're going to do. These are what your responsibilities are going to be. This and this and this and this. No one's inspired by that. Get your vision in there. Quit being a fool. Like people, they're a human being. They want to be inspired. They want to know the reason why they should work for you. They want to want to be called out to something greater. All of us want to be called out to something greater. And so first get the vision in there. Secondly, I have six questions at the end of the job description that we post on all those job sites. And at the very top, I put an asterisk, hey, just blindly submitting your resume without answering the questions below means an automatic denial. So I'm just, I'm being blatant. I'm I'm piercing. I want to pierce through the job descriptions and all that, all that stuff that's out there. Then those six core questions, like, 
Um, what stuck out to you about this job? What inspires you? Uh, what are your get? What are your personality types? Like Strings Finder, Myers Briggs, Disc. Because I want to craft. Like when I'm hiring, I know certain roles require different skill sets. For example, I'm great at starting stuff. I'm great at architecting stuff. I suck ass at implementing and following through uh, all the details. That's not me. So let's let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, the darker periods or struggles. I want to dig into um, how you've overcome them because I think it's very easy for people to assume that you you know you've got everything all figured out. So can you walk us through some of the darker times that you had building your business and what you were able to do to get yourself out of it? All right. One of the businesses that I'm um, involved in, another one I forgot about, a uh, health supplement company. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, um, that one. That yeah. one. Yeah. So we w- were launching an eight phase health cleanse system, you know, like a Dr. Axe a little bit or like a, uh, you know, just great supplements that cleanse your body, all that stuff. Anyway, they didn't get their second round of funding. And my company as a whole was owed like 50 grand. Um, for services that we had done. And I had kept on delivering, assuming we were getting the money and we ran out. And so now I'm in a financial bind. And also I didn't have the leadership team and the processes developed to support uh, our clients and support the company the way it needed to be. So the second half of last year, I started making those shifts. I started cutting losses um, and processes and elements of you know, whether there's a couple of staff that weren't performing or that business wasn't generating the re- new revenue it needed to for that uh, payroll side. And I had to cut some of the things out. And it was a hard, really hard decisions last year. But, you know, as one of my key leaders said this earlier this year, he's our, my video marketing uh, team member. And he said, Mike, you know, I feel like we're more nimble and than we've ever been. And it's exciting. And, and the weight has lifted from my shoulders because we're at a higher state of, you know, profitability and revenue and we're getting more and more in stronger clients. And I mean, even la- yesterday we picked up two really good clients. Um, and so, you know, but last, if you looked at me in August, I was like, man, how am I going to freaking meet payroll mm-hmm. for these guys? And because I had too much payroll for the amount of work we were doing. And we also weren't focused enough on what we, our core audience right now is e-commerce driven brands and then thought leaders like yourself, you know, podcasters, fitness influencers, authors, we want to build out their platforms and build sales funnels and everything around that for them. So, so we're, we're narrowed down on that. Okay. So while you're in that period of struggle, is there any, particular coping mechanisms or strategies that you use to help you get through that? Yeah. I mean, certainly prayer, certainly feeding, you know, those daily habits we talked about feeding my mind. Hey, if, if, if you feel like, you know, you're kind of stuck in the, in the trenches, man, one of the best things you can do on a daily basis is read something that gives you inspiration and encouragement and hope on how to get to the ne- that next level and get out of the trenches. What would you say is the hardest challenge or bad behaviors that you're currently working on with yourself or within your companies? Hmm. For me, it's continuing to develop some of the systems and the structure within the team. And and within myself, I've, I've got to continue to be more consistent as a leader um, in the sense of uh, connecting with my team um, when it's appropriate, when it's needed, giving them guidance and direction. All right. So let's, let's shift gears. And now we're going to move in, into the, uh, to the fun part of the show, which is the, the play hard round. You know, the show is basically work hard, play hard. So we're deconstructing not only work that all of us uh, type A uh, entrepreneurs want, but also to maximize the other areas of life that um, we don't really talk about, which is uh, playing hard. And I, I love to hear how people are maximizing those areas of life outside of work. So 
you're no stranger to travel. Uh, you and I are kindred spirits in that way. You've lived in uh, Argentina for an extended period of time. So how do you feel that living abroad has helped you in terms of your business? Argentina, I moved there in 2010 uh, for a mini sabbatical. And I was inspired by the four-hour work week. And I honestly, I, I moved there for the month of, so six weeks was the goal late October and up until Thanksgiving. And what was cool about that is it was springtime slash early summertime there. And so I was missing the winter and the fall. And it's, it's actually forces you to become less of an operator and it forces you to remove yourself and think, how, how do I actually design a system where, hey, I can actually unplug for several weeks. Um, like my fiance and I are getting married in, in Florence, Italy this summer on, on May 15th guess what? We're going to stay in Europe for a month mm. and at least two of the weeks while I'm there, I'm not going to check work email. I'm not going to check Slack. I'm going to actually fully vacation, maybe more. But, you know, one of our goals is to uh, live in one of the world's 50 great cities every year for a month. And, you know, last year uh, was L.A., you know, a month consecutively. And this year might, who knows, it might end up being LA again, but we're going to spend at least a month in Europe to just experience, you know, uh, what's happening in Europe. And it forces you, forces you to think about your business and make those key strategic decisions as well. Also, those epiphanies come when you have space to breathe. Sometimes we run so hard. One of the things we're not, we back to the middle class mindset is, and we run our answer in the middle class mindset is, hey, you want to make more money, work harder, work harder, work longer, boom, boom, boom. And yes, you got to work hard. And yes, you got to work longer sometimes. But, you know, you look at um, you look at a billionaire. Um, you watch the TV shows with a billionaire on TV. Is he sitting around? Does he mow his own yard? Does he even make his own cup of tea? He doesn't even make his own freaking cup of tea. What's he doing? He's got space to think, space to make better decisions. So, you, so you're so you're building in the bandwidth to do those things by doing things like living abroad and you know having it thirty days in in LA or whatever. Speaking speaking of that, your your home base is Nashville, but you've been spending increasingly more time in LA. Mm -hmm. Why is that, and how has your experience in Los Angeles been? Dude, I, it's the reason is because I love the creative energy out here. It also helps me break some of those patterns of working operationally in my business. Um, and, um, and, and so a lot of our clients that are out here and just a lot of, a lot of other good people like our mutual friend, Chris and Lori Harder, just love hanging with them and others that they're just up to big things out here. And Nashville certainly has that too, but the creative energy for me and also some of the pathways I want to go and build in my business, you know, I want to be more of a thought leader. I want to have more space, mental space to work on some of these other aspects of my own business that I, I wouldn't have if I was in Nashville because I just, my schedule would be jam packed. So I'm um, breaking our patterns and, and not doing the same thing over and over. That's one of the huge benefits of traveling as well. Mm-hmm. And when you start shifting those energies, different things, um, different things happen. So I, I'm really starting to embrace that concept more and more. So I like the fact that, you know, you brought that up. Yep. Yep. Totally. Yeah. It, it just opens up so many new pathways and it's such a fun, and, and we forget too, life is supposed to be fun. And so when you invite more play into your life, then then you get to remember that, man, uh, your, your op new new things open up that wouldn't have opened up. And and so, like, I love one of the things of traveling in foreign countries is, like, man, I get to I get to try a bunch of different foods and discover yeah. foods. <laughs> right? So you also, in the, in the Play Hard wheel, wheelhouse, you're also into skydiving and hang gliding. How did you get into that? And what is it about those particular activities that you enjoy 
um, like you actually wound up in hang gliding and paragliding magazine. So like, you're not just somebody that plays with it. How did that all happen? <laughs> well, um, they, uh, just facing my fears, frankly, I'm actually afraid of heights. Mm. So like the, the, the first time I went skydiving, like I did, I was, uh, I literally had the, you know, tandem jumper press again, like the airplane that we were in was in Hawaii um, and, and there's just a whole open side of the airplane and we're flying up and the airplane's turning. And it's almost like I looked at it and I was like, dude, I could slide right out. And, and we're only like 10,000 feet. I could slide out <laughs> into the, uh, before I'm supposed to. Yeah. And, and then, so I was grabbing on the bars up above and then I had my tandem jumper, um, that was attached to, I had him pushed up against the wall at the very corner, far corner. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, at one point, he's like, Mike, you need to loosen up, bro. I, I, you're you're squeezing me back here. <laughs> like, it's going to be all right. So just to face my fears with it, um, a fear of heights, it's not something I, I frankly want to do regularly by any means. But, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, but it's just something that uh, now I do love to uh, kite surf. And, or kiteboard. I do want to do that much more. And that's, that's a ton of fun. I did that in Buenos Aires for the first time and, and fingers crossed, I'll finally actually block off a week to just do that and make it a pure pleasure. trip. Yeah, man, I've, I've never done that. I did the, uh, I did hang gliding, um, off of, um, Oh, I can't think of the name of the mountain in, uh, in Rio. And that was, um, an absolutely unbelievable experience. If anybody wants to see that live, you can go to our jet set life, uh, Facebook, uh, not Facebook, uh, YouTube page, and you can, uh, search for jet set life, um, Rio, and you'll see me and Kim, my wife going mm, off like the cool. top of the mountain. And it's Dude, freaking, that's awesome. freaking hysterical. All right. So let's wrap up with a few rapid fire questions. Cool. Feel free to answer as quickly or as slowly as you want to. Are there any particular books that you've reread and which particular ones of theirs do you recommend that people start with? Yeah. Uh, for our work, we got to read that power of full engagement, all about energy management and how central that is to uh, managing. It's more important than managing your time, managing the four key areas, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual energy, war of art. Is the third one I would highly, highly recommend uh, overcoming your resistance, procrastination. I mentioned strategic coaches, uh, 80% approach. Ordered that from Amazon. Take you 35 minutes to read it. So easy, so quick um, about overcoming all that stuff, procrastination. And then the fifth, I would say um, Blue Ocean Strategy. Mm, I just um, bought that and the follow up. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Why, why do you recommend the War of Art? I've heard that one recommended a thousand times. I've never done it, dude. You gotta read. Ah, uh, when you read it, when you read the first thirty pages, you'll be like, "Whoa!" It's really? gonna make you, make your head spin. And so, it takes you an hour and a half to read it too. But I've oh, read so it five cool. times. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. What's the one app on your phone that you can't live without? Probably text message app. What's the most interesting conversation you've had lately? Uh, maybe this one right now. Yeah, okay. What's the best advice for your 20 year old self? Join a mastermind sooner. Peer group accelerates everything. We're, we're going to get into how people can join your mastermind in a sec, but what's the, uh, if I were to talk to your friends and ask them what your superpowers are, what would they answer? Strategy, ideation, architecting, and connecting deeply with people to figure out what they really want in life and their business. If you had to give a TED talk on nothing that you're known for or nothing that you speak about, but it could be on anything that you like or you have a passion for, what else would it be? I'd say love hmm. and the centrality of love and beauty and, and what makes us human and what makes us come alive. Well, dude, that is a perfect way to end on that note. I could not end on a better note. Um, I, can't, I can't thank you enough personally uh, for being in my life, um, guiding me, frankly, with this podcast um, and getting to know you and your, your lovely bride-to-be. Uh, super excited mm -hmm. about flying out to Los Angeles uh, to see you uh, tomorrow 
actually, um, yeah. over the weekend anyway. Um, so thank you. Uh, and and, and uh, hopefully your team is listening to this podcast. And I want to thank each and every one of them for um, helping this brand get off the ground and uh, for really going above and beyond. Um, you and your team are uh, incredible. So for people that either, you know, want to do what I did with you, uh, which is, uh, you know, a strategy session that, you know, led into more uh, branding, website uh, design, et cetera, or they want to be a part of your mastermind, what's the best, um, what's the gateway drug to Mike Zeller? Good question. If you want to reach out to me personally on any of that, email me at mike at mikezeller.com. Uh, but also, yeah, you can check out my website there. My mastermind is risingstarsmastermind.com. We have one or two spots left. There is an application process. You can knock that out at the website. If it's a good fit for you or you have further questions, you can email me, but knock out an application. Uh, but it's a, it's a, always a joy to connect with you, Rob. And, and I'm so glad my team has kicked butt and served you well. I'm proud of them and, and grateful for them. Life is more fun when you're working with really smart people doing great things. Amen, brother. Thanks again for the interview. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks, brother. Have a good day. All right. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and you know someone that needs some help in either stepping up their work hard game or their play hard game, it would mean the world to me if you shared this podcast with them to help me get this movement out there. So if you like what you heard, head on over to iTunes, take 30 seconds and leave me a five star review and I will be forever grateful. So until the next episode, excuses are over. It's time to live.